Hey, welcome everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Sermons and Cars, where we drive around and we talk about theology. We theologize about life and perspective and, um, yeah. Welcome. If it's your first time uh, tuning into this podcast, my name is Tony Martell. I'm one of the hosts here, and um, we are smack dab in the middle of a conversation. The title of this series is called What the Hell? Now, it's part four. Each each one builds on itself a little bit more. Um, the premise of this is the idea, asking the question... Uh, you know, like, what What the hell have we been believing? Oh, come on. Wake up, church! Wake up. I feel like today, more than ever, and I've been saying this a few times now, it's like we go into church and we just check our brains at the door. We just, we don't, we don't, we don't, we just, we don't ask any questions. We just, whatever the pastor says, whatever the teacher says, that whatever somebody says, it's just like, yes, bah, we just nod our heads, you know, we open up the Bible. Well, that's what the Bible says, and so that must be it. We hear so many preachers say things like, this isn't my idea, this is the Bible's. This, I'm just reading what the Bible says. And here's the thing. If we don't routinely question, examine, and even put uh, on trial specific beliefs, within our faith traditions, if we don't routinely, rigorously do this as a normal practice, what inevitably ends up happening is the idea, the belief becomes enshrined, it becomes untouchable. And once that happens, and it doesn't take long, once that happens, it becomes like an idol. The same exact thing can be said about your pastor, your, your whoever is in um, leadership, if they are not held accountable, routinely questioned, what are they up to? What are you, why are you believing this? Where is this coming from? They become untouchable. They become enshrined, right? A lot of you are nodding your head like, oh yeah, I actually recognize that in action. Yep. Yeah, that's a, well, let that be a warning sign because something isn't, something is not, something is off balance, right? So we're in a series titled, What the Hell? It's building on it, it it builds on conceptually you know so it's it starts with you know how does how are we understanding god right what are the concepts we have about him because how we understand god is going to inform how we live and so if god is a is a is an arbiter a judge standing over you every like just waiting to pounce every second you make a mistake where you're going to live under this veil of condemnation it's not a good place to be it's not a good place to live if you understand the gospel, as as a great many people do, you understand the gospel as being um, uh, that you are cut off and separated from God because of because of sin, and that in order to in order to uh, go to heaven or even experience the goodness of God, you have to believe in Jesus. Otherwise, you you go to hell. If you understand the gospel as your default position, your starting point in life is hell, and that in order to get out of it, you gotta you have to cross the bridge of Jesus in order to get out of it. Okay, well this podcast is for you. Today we want to take a deep breath, hit pause, and let's just think about the word hell, for example. Okay, just the word hell. Okay, we're going to put aside any other notions like salvation or judgment or eternity. We're going to put those words aside, those concepts, and we're just going to look at the word hell. I want to tell you exactly what happens in the Bible when we, when we don't question translations, when we let people determine what things mean for us. I'm going to tell you what happens. We take a word like hell in our English in our English Bibles, but, but if we do a little reading and a little digging, we're gonna we're gonna go to the Bible. We're gonna see in the translations that the word hell isn't there. What we're gonna find instead are four concepts, individual, unique concepts that get blanketed under the umbrella hell. Old Testament, written in 
ancient Hebrew. Well, most of it was. We're gonna find a word there, Sheol. Old translations, beginning with the King James, called it hell. But Sheol had it had had a had an eye had a concept with it. It was this place of the dead. It's just where everybody went. It lacked character. It lacked color. It was void of of existence. Actually, just that's where they went until the next thing. Now, the thing about the ancient days is that the next thing had yet to be revealed. So Sheol was a holding place. You get to the New Testament. The New Testament uses the word Hades. Now, Hades is interesting. Hades brings with it a concept and a persona. So in first century, a first century Greek reader would have read Hades and would immediately have uh, had in their, in their head the Greek god of the underworld. So Hades is both a personality and a place. Now Hades and Sheol, they have some overlap conceptually, Sheol being the place of the dead. Hades is also the place of the dead, but also the god of the underworld. Hades is the one that, that owns it all. So we've got two. The third one in the New Testament you're gonna find is Tartarus. Tartarus is a unique uh, example of um, afterlife um, placement. And it is, it's found I think in Peter and it's described as the place where um, fallen angels are held in confinement until a day of judgment. Um, so it is indeed a place of, of uh, punishment, uh, confinement, imprisonment in the afterlife or, or the next life or possibly even this present life as we're, as we're experiencing it. But it's not used contextually to refer to a place for humans. Now, there are extra biblical, meaning outside sources, different writers <clears throat> of, uh, of that time period that will use Tartarus as a place for specific people. But it's not at all a place where your average normal person would ever go, right? This is a place reserved specifically for the, the, the lowest of the worst possible. Now, now you can do your own research. You can see and, and find some examples of this. But suffice it to say, Tartarus is not for humans, at least in the Bible, it's not. So here you've got Tartarus, we've got Hades, we've got Sheol. Sheol and Hades have some overlap. Tartarus is not Hades and Hades is not Tartarus. It's its own thing. Uh, we've got this fourth idea. And this fourth one is in the New Testament. It's found 13 times and it's this word Gehenna. Now, Gehenna is also translated hell. What's interesting about Gehenna is that it has its origin in the Old Testament. And it's found in 2 Chronicles, and it's this, it's the Valley of Hinnom. And it's the place where specific certain kings would take their children, sacrifice their children in the fires on Mount Moriah to a god named Moloch. By the time Jeremiah comes on the scene and he's writing within a few hundred years, the land had become cursed and there was so much legend surrounding it that Isaiah even refers to it as a place where the fire never goes out. It was a place you didn't want to go. It was a land cursed. Uh, uh, Jeremiah even uh, refers to Jerusalem as, as being likened to the Valley of Hinnom. Now what's interesting is that by the time first century comes around, this Valley of Hinnom, this Gehenna, had become associated with this afterlife understanding. This idea that when you die, not everybody, but a select few people find themselves in this, this place. Now first century rabbis are, are uh, and a lot of them, had the position, held the position that that if you ended up in Gehenna, if, and it was a huge if, your sentence there lasted no more than one year. The idea was that you would you would 
use this time would be used to help you learn and let go and be be purged, so to speak. I don't know if that's the right word. Um, of, of the things that uh, misled you and misguided you that you clung to in your earthly world. And here's another kicker, is that they all believed that even in Gehenna, on the Sabbath day, you would get a break from that. So if you ended up in Gehenna, the most time you would be there would be one year, and, and you would even get a break every Sabbath of whatever punishment you were enduring or whatever, whatever was happening to you. <clears throat> After which you'd be released so that you could then go on to that next phase of, of the afterlife, uh, presumably being heaven of some kind. Here's where it gets interesting. For me, that's the first century understanding the rabbis have when they're using this word Gehenna. Now what we've done is ever since the King James Version, everything gets blanketed under hell, but Gehenna is not a hell. Now granted, nobody wants to go there, right? I don't wanna go there. I'm sure you don't. But Gehenna isn't Tartarus. Tartarus isn't Hades and Hades isn't Sheol. But what we've done is we've trans, if we've, we've blanketed it all under the umbrella of hell. So anytime in the Old Testament you read, if I were to, you know, let's say in Psalm 139, if I wrap myself in, in hell, as some translations had it, uh, there your presence finds me. But, but that's not hell. But yet we've translated it as hell. Or when we come to the New Testament when, um, when uh, yeah, I think maybe Jesus says, um, you know, and the gates of hell shall not prevail when he talks to Peter. Upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of, gates of hell will not prevail. It's not hell. It's the gates of Hades will not prevail, which is, which, which is different. But if we're reading a passage and we translate it in our minds, it says hell, we have all of this imported imagery over the years, thanks to Dante, Hollywood, and fire and brimstone preaching that has taught us to understand hell as this like eternally tormented place of separation and, and tragis, travesty and, and, and torture and it's but it's not okay Tartarus is Tartarus Hades is Hades Sheol is Sheol and Gehenna is Gehenna and they all while they have some overlap conceptually I, I suppose they're all unique in their own right and one of the worst things we've done is overlap them and put them all under a single concept. And we've misguided people. We've created systems of thought and belief that hold people to this idea that, you're, that that's your starting point. That unless you believe in Jesus, you're destined for a quote, hell. And nothing could be further from the truth. So, so, okay, so maybe you're like, well, all right then, Tony. If it's not a hell, well, what is Jesus talking about when he says things like, you know, better to cut your arm off to, and to enter life maimed than to enter uh, Gehenna, which is the translation, enter Gehenna uh, with all of your members. And it's like, well, let's understand how Christ would have understood it. I think it's fair to assume that he would have had a healthy understanding of Gehenna as this place where, where you, um, where if you went there for some sort of wickedness, if, and it was a huge if, he had an understanding that maybe you only went there for one year, after which you were released. But let's take it even a next step further. What is Gehenna? Gehenna is this valley. Right? So what is it symbolically? Symbolically, it was a place where, where wicked people would sacrifice their children in the fires for something. So maybe when Jesus brings in front of everybody a child, as he does in Matthew 18, and he elevates the child and says, look, look, if any of you causes one of these little ones to stumble, these little ones who believe in me, who just innately understand the way of Christ, you cause any one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better it would be better that you, you tie a millstone around your neck, throw yourself into the, into, into the water, 
He says, woe to the world that caused these things to happen to people. It'd be better that you cut your hand off or gouge your eye out, enter life maimed than it would be to enter into Gehenna with all of your parts working. So if he brings a child in front of everybody, and then he uses a very specific reference that has to do with an Old Testament kings that would sacrifice their children in the fires of Moriah, and he's making a very crystal clear connection that says, if you're doing something in your community that's gonna in any way, shape, or form put a little child or anyone who believes in me in way of harm, it's like you're doing the exact same thing the kings did when they sacrificed their children on the fires of Moriah. So when I read that, I'm like, I check myself and I'm like, is, is, there, is there a system that I'm a part of that I'm not even aware of? Because that should instill in all of us a greater fear of the, of, the, of the potential punishment that awaits than anything else. And that's what Jesus is communicating here. So if you're here and you're like, well, I'm afraid of the, uh, this, this, this idea that's been held over you that says you're destined for hell, like a Dante hell or, or a Hollywood version of hell, let's just, you can erase that. You can begin to take a pencil, turn it around, use the eraser, start erasing it piece by piece. No matter how ingrained it is, how strong and powerful that thought is in your mind, you can start erasing it because it's not what is taught in the Bible. And you know, guys, for me, it's been a long, it's been a long journey of allowing myself to not receive what is what is taught at a church. And that's really hard to do. Right, it's hard when somebody has your microphone and they're the ones that's supposed to have the answers of God or they're the one that is, that's told that, uh, or everybody has the impression and understand and collective understanding that the person speaking is speaking the word of God. Right, if you've ever been in that setting, that alone is hard enough to then say, I don't think I'm gonna receive this because it's to say, well, I'm not receiving the word of God. And you really do have to employ some mental gymnastics. Some spiritual gymnastics, we can call them. To get yourself out of that. And that's what I want to do today. I want to give you some, some tools so that you can go to the, the mental gym. And say, hold on a second. Every time, you know this, every time you hear the word hell ever in church or when you read it in the Bible, you have the right to actually go to a, a Bible dictionary and look it up and see what, what actual word is that. And if it's Gehenna, you ought to go to the context and figure out well, what is what is Jesus speaking of? What context is he speaking of? Are we hurting people in some way that likens the action we're doing to the action that the kings were doing when they sacrificed their children? Because that's the very clear imagery that he's calling upon. And that's super important for us. Super important. If anything, it should be freeing. And that should be good news for you today, that you're, you're not bound up, you're not held hostage by this, this um, fire and torture and eternal torment. That's not, that's not for you. That is not your destiny today. Your destiny is life. Christ came that he might give you life. That's a Zoe life right here, an eternal life right now. Right now. So that's it. That's it for today, guys. I hope this is encouraging. I hope it's. Uh, I hope you learned something. Um, yeah. We'll check you next time. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Talk to you guys next time.